It is a great privilege to be back with you. I was here last year and uh, spoke about sacramental theology, and it's uh, a delight to be back in England and to be back uh, with you all. Many of you seeing seeing you again this year, and uh, many old friends getting caught up with uh, friends that uh, we made during our several years in Cambridge, and uh, and others that we've met along the way uh, here in Great Britain. Um, uh, I've been, I was assigned the topic, The Very Practical Doctrine of the Trinity, uh, by Steve Jeffrey. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a very English title for a series of lectures. Um, and I've been trying to contemplate what it means to make the doctrine of the Trinity practical. Uh, there are a few areas of Christian teaching and Christian theology where uh, there are so many technical terms uh, technical concepts, difficult concepts, and terms and concepts that have to be used in exactly the right way in order to avoid saying the wrong thing and saying something heretical, something that's going to exclude you from the circle of, of the Christian faith. Uh, in order to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity properly, we have to speak about a God who is both one and three, a God who is three persons and yet is only one God. We have to learn to use uh, terminology like person and essence, and we have to have some, some sense of what those words might mean. Uh, God is one essence, whatever that means. He's three persons, whatever person means. And we can't flip that around and say that he is one person and three essences without running afoul of what's become Christian orthodoxy, what has been Christian orthodoxy uh, explicit, explicitly since the fourth century of of Christian history, 4th century AD. Uh, so that's one set of concepts and terms that we have to, uh, we have to learn the grammar, we have to speak this rightly in order to avoid saying something that's going to be misleading, something that leads into either a Unitarian view that the God is only one without the diversification of three, or that God is somehow a com commun community of diverse individuals, a Father, Son, and Spirit that are not, uh, one, that don't constitute one God. Do we have to talk about these philosophical concepts uh, in order to talk about the Trinity? Uh, we have to talk about God as he is in himself and God as he reveals himself. God as he eternally exists and God as he shows himself in the course of history. And we have to consider what the relationship between those two realities is. Um, what is the connection between God as he exists eternally as he would exist eternally and would continue to exist regardless of whether the world was, and God as he reveals himself in the gospel story, especially uh, in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ's relationship with his Father and the Spirit. How are those two things related? Uh, we have to grapple with statements that Jesus makes about the Trinity. Jesus in John 17 and elsewhere in John's gospel says, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Uh, God dwells in the Son. The Father makes the Son his dwelling place, and at the same time, the Son makes the Father his dwelling place. The Father is inside the Son, and yet at the same time, the Son is inside the Father. Now, that isn't just technical. That seems odd and weird. We don't, that doesn't seem possible that you could have something that is both inside and outside the same thing at the same time. That's a logical contradiction. Um, the the, uh, uh, the, the sheer confession of a God who's three in one seems to some to be a logical, rational contradiction. And so it's sometimes defended as well. We can't understand any of this. We just assert it. We assert that God is Father, Son, and Spirit without knowing exactly what that means. We assert he's one God without knowing exactly how Father, Son, and Spirit work together. But that's because God is transcendent. He's beyond us. And this is a sign of how transcendent he is that even in the basic affirmation and confession we make about God, we don't know what we're talking about. Uh, that's a sign of how just how transcendent God is. So how do we make all that practical? That doesn't seem like a very practical start. Uh, we're talking about philosophical concepts like substance, essence, person. Uh, we're talking about the relationship between eternity, God's eternal character and his life as God and his revelation of himself in history. We're talking about these strange realities of the different persons indwelling one another mutually at the same time. So how do, we, how do we go about making that practical uh, to Christian living? How do we make it meaningful to us? Either intellectually, that would be, that would be an achievement. 
uh, just to make it intellectually meaningful, uh, but how do we make it practically meaningful? How does it become something like a guide to our life? Well, we might follow the example of Immanuel Kant. Uh, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher from the Enlightenment, uh, was a, had a pietistic Christian background, uh, and he thought in pietistic terms and sometimes tried to grapple with questions that came out of Christian theology. Uh, but he wanted to do it as a philosopher. He didn't think that the doctrine of the Trinity or any other of the doctrines of the Christian church are metaphysically true. They're not actually describing how God is. We can't possibly know what God is actually like. Uh, there's a boundary beyond which we can't go, Kant says. And if we say that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that God is three in one, and that's actually a true statement about God as he is in himself, we're going beyond the limits of human knowledge. So we can't actually know that. And yet the doctrine of the Trinity, he said, does have practical value. In fact, that's the, that's the only value it has. It, as a dogma, it has no practical value. It's intellectually meaningless, but it does have practical value, provided we translate it into practical terms and kind of give up the dogma. So we don't say God is Father, Son, and Spirit as a statement about God. We say Father, Son, and Spirit as a statement kind of about us and about how we live. So we abandon the dogma in order to make the doctrine practical. It's not the doctrine being practical anymore, it's just uh, the doctrine being translated or allegorized into practical terms. We say God is Father because we affirm that uh, whatever there is that's beyond that horizon, beyond that boundary that we can actually know is love. And to say that God is Father is to say that he's love. To speak about the Son is not to speak about a, an eternal divine person, Kant says, but it's to affirm that humanity is the, beloved, uh, is the object of God's love. Humanity is the Son of God. And so when we affirm the divinity of the Son, we're saying something about the nature of humanity in its relationship to God the Father. God the Father is love. God the Son, the huma which is humanity, is uh, the beloved of God. And God the Spirit is the, uh, our agreement with the God who is love. Um, our agreement with and our response to the God who is love. So we can, uh, Kant says we can translate or allegorize the doctrine of the Trinity into something that makes some practical sense, that has something to do that touches human life in some way. But in order to do that, he abandons the, the doctrine of the Trinity. So uh, do we want to follow Kant's example when we talk about the very, not just the practical, but the very practical doctrine of the Trinity? Should we follow Kant's lead? Um, well, I, this... Uh, been speaking for about five minutes and I've kind of put myself in a corner because I'm talking about Immanuel Kant and also trying to talk about the practicality of the doctrine of the Trinity and these two things don't really don't really go together. Um, but I think we can't follow, we cannot follow Kant's example. In fact, I think we have to do the opposite. We have to affirm the doctrine of the Trinity and it's only by affirming the doctrine as a truth about God, which is, Kant says we can't really know, uh, the doctrine has something that is an affirmation of God's nature and character. It's only when we do that that it really really becomes practical. And I realized after reflecting on the uh, title that was imposed, I mean given to me, uh, the, very, the very practical doctrine of the Trinity. The word doctrine is in there. So I said, I don't just have to talk about practice. I can talk about theology, which is kind of more my sweet spot. As long as I make it clear that it has some practical import, I can still talk about doctrine. So I do want to, what I want to do in the next uh, uh, several hours with you is to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity. And I will be talking about some of the technical aspects of that doctrine and how it's been thought about and talked about among theologians and in the creeds and so on. Um, but I am uh, 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 talking about those things because I believe we have to talk about those issues. We have to talk about the doctrine of the Trinity before we can come to the point where we're making any kind of affirmation or any kind of conclusion, drawing any kind of conclusion about what makes it practical. Uh, we have to, it's the very practical doctrine of the Trinity that we're dealing with. Not just the very practical Trinity, it's the doctrine that we want to deal with. The reality of God, of course, but the way that that reality of God has been described and summarized in the church and is uh, revealed in the scriptures. I want to do that in under four headings. Um, I'm going to have to talk four times. I'm sorry that I didn't provide notes. That was an oversight on my part. I should have gotten ahead, gotten ahead of the game and gotten those to Steve ahead of time, but I didn't. Uh, I want to talk about, in this session, um, who is God? 
what do we say about God himself? Uh, in the next session, I want to ask, where do we find God? Uh, if we believe that we're creatures of God, made to commune with God, made to have fellowship with him, and that's the meaning of our lives, is to have fellowship with our creator. Um, if that's true, we need to have some way to access him. We need to have to find him. He needs to be available to us. Or we need to have find, find some pathway that leads to God. How do we find that? And I'm going to say that the doctrine of the Trinity is the answer to that question. Uh, I want to ask, who am I? Uh, what does it mean to be a human being? What kind, of, what kind of creatures are we? And again, I'm going to say that the doctrine of the Trinity gives us a clue to that. Uh, the nature of God gives us a clue to the nature of human beings who are made in the image of this God. Uh, but we can know what that means only if we start with the doctrine of the Trinity. That is, only if we have certain affirmations and truths, and we, we believe certain truths about who God is, then we can begin to think about what it means for human beings to made, be made in the image of that God. And then finally, I want to talk about how we should then live. Um, how, how, should, how should we live before this God um, that uh, has made us and made us in his image? Uh, and all of this is going to be premised on certain theological discussion, certain doctrinal discussion. Uh, and I'm not apologizing for that, I'm just warning you. Uh, I, and I'm not apologizing because I think we have to start there in order to understand what we are talking about or what we want to say about the practical implications. Uh, we can think, think about the relationship between theory and practice more generally. Uh, uh, Karl Barth, in one of his books, gives this list of practical sermon titles from uh, some 19th century German pastor. This is one way to think about practical teaching in the church. For the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, this pastor uh, did a sermon on the duties of Christian congregations saved from the grave risk of fire. That's very practical. It's very specifically practical, uh, but if you haven't been saved from grave risks of fire, it's hard to know exactly how to apply it. On Easter, he preached on reasonable rules for Christian burial of corpses. How do you go about burying the dead? Pentecost, how to keep the faithful, uh, how to keep uh, faithful and safe during thunderstorms. Uh, that's a practical uh, sermon. The first Sunday after Trinity was on the horrific sin of premeditated murder. <laughs> Wonder what kind of congregation this guy had. <laughs> it sounds like a dangerous place to be. You got fires and thunderstorms and uh, potential for premeditated murder on the part of congregants. So uh, you can make, you can do practical, practical teaching like that. That's just talking about uh, here are the rules and the steps you go through in order to bury a Christian corpse. Uh, these are the ways that you avoid the sin of premeditated murder. This is where you go during a heavy thunderstorm so that you can be safe and faithful. You want to remain faithful in a thunderstorm, not just safe. Um, but that's not just, that's not the only way to be practical. Uh, we, we, I think we can draw analogies from science and think about the relation in thinking about the relationship with, between theory and practice. Um, Christianity is not a science in the way that we think about science, but I think there's an analogy there. Uh, not all scientific discoveries come as a result of meditation and, and uh, application of theory, but many do, uh, and we enjoy the benefits of nuclear energy in the modern world because of the application of a particular scientific theory uh, that was developed by Einstein. It's the theory comes first and then the theory is applied and it has practical real world implications as uh, people think. Well, if, if Einstein is right about X, then we should be able to do this and produce this effect in the world. And that actually turns out to be the case and we can have nuclear power, we can also have nuclear bombs but it's the result of an application of theory. And arguably, that's the way that uh, Western science has progressed. That Western science has progressed uh, partly because of accidental discoveries, partly because of, of the long labor of scientists in the lab, but also uh, largely because of uh, good theories. Theories about the world that were uh, close enough to the truth. They weren't exhaustive. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't explain everything, but they were close enough to reality that they gave... Uh, that they implied certain things about how uh, we to go, were to go about uh, trying to exploit the world for our benefit. Uh, we can think about uh, the ways that uh, certain legal concepts have uh, legal theories affect the way that we live. 
uh, certain legal theories, certain philosophical theories that enter into law that affect the way the laws are formulated that then go on to either, at least to, to teach us certain things about the way we should live together in our societies and maybe even shape the way we live together by the application and enforcement of those laws. I uh, wrote a column uh, this past week on what's known as dignity juris jurisprudence and the use of the term dignity in uh, particularly in American law but it's become an important concept in international law. Uh, dignity is a right uh, to uh, be respected for the autonomous choices that you make, right to be respected for the particular character that you have in, in America has been used as a basis for, uh, it was the basis for the same-sex marriage decision uh, in uh, last, last summer in the United States. It's because of the dignity of gay persons that their choices should be, uh, they have an inherent dignity as human persons, their choices have an inherent dignity and th those choices should res be respected by the rest of society. Not necessarily agreed with, but shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be attacked or insulted. Everyone has a right to the, uh, at least to the respect, if not the approval of everyone else. Uh, that's a pretty abstract uh, uh, theory, pretty abstract idea of, of dignity. It's uh, a difficult thing to apply in practice in, in, uh, in any kind of detail in the world, in actual law, but it's been applied in the United States and it's applied more generally uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world in international law. That's a theory, but it's a theory about human nature. It's a theory about um, the nature of law and what law should do that has uh, massive practical import for the way that laws are determined, the way the laws are passed, the way the laws are enforced, and so on. Uh, we can think more, more on the ground, too, think about how uh, theory and practice work together in our families. You might uh, think about having a theory of family life, uh, but you, there's some kind of implicit theory that's at work in your family. A theory is simply a way of looking at things, an overall uh, viewpoint of things. Theoria in uh, Greek doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily mean a systematized uh, account of something. It means a vision of something. Uh, in your, uh, you're having an overall vision of your family life. Uh, in legal, legal scholars have an overall vision of what kind of society they want to, uh, they want to have, and the, that theory guides the particular uh, ways that they make decisions, the way that they pass laws and so on. But you have some kind of implicit theory of family that answers questions like, uh, what are families for? Where did the family come from? If you have children, you have certain assumptions about uh, who those children are. Where did they come from? Who owns them? What are your aims for them? You want your children to have a good life, but then you have to step back and ask, well, what is a good life? And that's a kind of theoretical question. It's a question about overall goals and aims. And uh, if you don't have some kind of at least half-developed theory of family life, then it's hard to uh, grapple with unexpected twists and turns in your family. If you don't have some overall vision of where you want your family to go or what you want your kids to do, how you want your kids to grow up, then it's hard to navigate through the inevitable disagreements that parents have with each other. How do you decide when uh, a husband, dad wants to do this and mom wants to do this? How do you, how do you work through that? Uh, that's a, you have to step back and ask the question, well, what are we aiming for in general with our family? What are we aiming for in general with uh, our kids as we, as we raise them? So if you don't have that, you're kind of stumbling from place to place. You're making it up as you go along. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to deal with, uh, uh, with, uh, unexpected, uh, with the unexpected in family life, which is sh you should expect. You should expect the unexpected when you're raising a family because things are not going to go exactly the way that you intended them to. And uh, some kind of theoretical, some kind of overall perspective on the aims of your family, the purpose of your family, the aims that you have with your children, um, the means that you use to achieve those aims, all of that has to be at least implicitly in place. And it's best if it's more explicitly in order to uh, raise a family well. Theory and practice are not at odds with each other. In order to, uh, in order to work well in all of these areas, in science and law, in your family life, you have to have some overall vision of what you're, what you're after, uh, what you're aiming for, and how you're going to get there. And I want to suggest that the same thing is true when we talk about the Trinity. The Trinity is a kind of doctrine in general, is a kind of theory. The doctrine of the Trinity is a kind of theory about God. It's a vision or understanding of God. It's 
one that shapes the way uh, our imaginations and our desires for God. And by doing that, it's going to shape the way we live before God, the way we pray, the way we worship. Everything we're doing is going to be shaped by the theory of God that we're operating with, uh, by the doctrine that we're given. So uh, the very practical doctrine of the Trinity, that's not a contradiction in terms. It's not a contradiction to say, to talk about the doctrine of God on the one hand and the practical, uh, practical Christian living on the other. In fact, we can't really talk about practice. We okay? can't talk about practice well unless we have this kind of background uh, in our doctrine and in our theology. So as I said, my first talk, I want to ask the question, who is God? Uh, and I want to make the point, uh, among other things, that uh, contrary to the way the doctrine of the Trinity is sometimes presented, uh, the Trinity is not just a numbers game. It looks like a numbers game. How many, how many gods do you worship? I worship one God. Who is that one God that you worship? Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, that sounds like three. Well, no, it's not three, it's one. But it is also three. It sounds like because you're playing with numbers. Uh, and it looks like it's just not just a numbers game, but it looks like a not very fair numbers game. It doesn't look like a normal kind of numbers game. But that's not the issue, really. The issue is not about the numbers, the one and the three. The issue is about what kind of God it is that we confess, believe in, trust, worship, pray to, and obey. It's not just about three and one. It's about what kind of God this God who is Father, Son, and Spirit is. Who is God is, uh, the answer is Father, Son, and Spirit, and that's, that says something about the character of God, particularly uh, the character of God as opposed to the gods of the world, the various gods of the ancient world uh, into which Christianity first came, and the various gods that we are surrounded by in the modern world even today. I want to begin by looking at uh, some biblical passages that trace out some of the basics of the doctrine of the Trinity, the basics of God's Trinitarian revelation. And I want to start with the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament doesn't reveal uh, Father, Son, and Spirit in an explicit way. The Old Testament doesn't use that formula to name God. Uh, and yet the Old Testament is giving us uh, background for that fuller revelation of God as Father, Son, and Spirit that comes in the Gospel. And there's no inconsistency between what the Old Testament is revealing about God and what the New Testament reveals full, more fully about God. Uh, the uh, New Testament revelation of God as triune is a fulfillment of monotheism, a fulfillment that is of Jewish monotheism of what the Old Testament teaches about the one God and the nature of that oneness in God. And you have uh, hints throughout the Old Testament that there is plurality within God. You be it begins from the very first chapter of Genesis, as many of the church fathers pointed out. Uh, the first chapter of Genesis includes plural pronouns that are used of God. And particularly when God begins to work to uh, make man in his image. Uh, at that point, God no longer speaks as I uh, or my. He begins to speak as we. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. There's a plurality there. And it's specifically when he begins to create human beings, male and female, after his likeness. It's at that point that God uh, turns to speaking in the plural. And sometimes you hear uh, the idea that this is consulting with the angels, that there's an angelic council that are participating in the creation of human beings. I don't think that's correct. God is making uh, a man and woman not in the image of the angels. He's making man and, men and women in, the image, in his image. But this image is an image of a God who can speak we. Not just a God who says I, but a God who can say we and let us and our image. Uh, that's a, a way that God speaks of himself. And there's some kind of inner Trinitarian, we know from the New Testament, there's some in, inner divine consultation going on. There's some kind of inner divine planning session. <laughs> Let us make man in our image. Uh, there's, there, there's a plurality there. And we see this coming up uh, a number of times in the Old Testament uh, after Genesis 1. When God reveals himself to Moses on Mount Sinai, for example, uh, we have both the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh uh, in the scene. And the relationship between them is not entirely sorted out for us. And this is again uh, a, a critical moment in the history of God's revelation of himself. He 
reveals himself in the creation. He reveals himself as a plural, as we, as us, in his creation of human beings. And now when God begins to initiate the process of the Exodus, and when he sends Moses back to Egypt in order to uh, call, Pharaoh, call on Pharaoh to let Israel go, he reveals himself and his name, and he does that in a context where his plurality is revealed. Now, this is Exodus 3. I'll read a few verses of it. Exodus 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mount of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst from a, uh, in the midst from a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. He said, do not come near, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And then he tells Moses what he's there to do. He's going to send Moses back in order to deliver Israel from Egypt. But notice the interplay of the different names for who is it? For whoever it is in the in the burning bush. Who's in the burning bush? Well, verse 2 says, The angel of Yahweh is in the blazing fire of the bush. The angel of Yahweh uh, is the person in there. But then verse 4 says, after Moses turns aside to look at it, it's Yahweh who's there. When Yahweh sees that Moses turns aside to look, then it's Elohim calls to him from the midst of the bush. Are these all different titles of the same person that's a possibility uh, are these uh, or are these titles of different persons or beings or entities somehow within Yahweh when we look at the rest of the Old Testament we find that uh, the latter is the case that is that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh although they are ident identified with one another as here the angel of Yahweh is in the midst of the bush Yahweh sees that Moses turns aside and calls to him the, whoever's in the bush is both Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh. And yet at other times in the Old Testament, we find that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are distinguished from one another, at least enough so that they can talk to one another. They can have a conversation with one another. Uh, the most dramatic example of this is later, much later in the Old Testament, in uh, Zechariah chapter 1, when Zechariah begins the night visions and he's seeing uh, the Lord's cavalry and he sees the angel of Yahweh uh, among them, the angel of Yahweh is the head of this cavalry of God. And the angel of Yahweh is praying. Verse 11 of Zechariah 1 says, um, So they answered the angel of Yahweh, that is the heads of the uh, soldiers who are on the horses. Uh, they answered the angel of Yahweh who is standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth and behold all the earth is peaceful and quiet. They've, they've gone out on recognizance. They've gone out to look at the earth and the earth is peaceful and quiet. Uh, that seems like it should be good news, but it's not for the angel of Yahweh. So the angel of Yahweh said, Yahweh of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and for the cities of Judah, which have been indignant these 70 years? And Yahweh answered the angel who was speaking with him with gracious words, with comforting words. As the angel was speaking with me, said, proclaim and said, thus says Yahweh of hosts, I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. So the angel of Yahweh speaks to Yahweh, addressing him as Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of armies, speak to the, speaks to him as a thou, how long wilt thou have no compassion? Yahweh answers the angel of Yahweh, and then the angel of Yahweh delivers a message that he got from Yahweh of hosts to Israel, a comforting message that the Lord is zealous for uh, Jerusalem and Zion, that he's jealous for the city and the people of God. Um, the, the peacefulness of the world is not good news because the peacefulness of the world is, uh, uh, it's a world in which Israel is still uh, downtrodden, still in exile. Uh, they need, or they're, they're, they're out of exile, but they're still downtrodden and they need to be revived. The world isn't as it should be. So peacefulness is not a good thing at this point. Things need to be disruptive and disrupted. And the angel of Yahweh knows that. And he prays a lament to Yahweh. So in one passage, we have Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh both inside the bush, those two names speaking of some entity, maybe a plural entity within the bush, we don't, it's hard to tell. But then when we see this open up in Zechariah 1, we see that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh are distinguished from another, one another, such that the angel of Yahweh and Yahweh can speak back and forth to each other. 
the angel can speak to Yahweh and call him you, thou. Uh, the, uh, the Lord, the, Yahweh, can speak to the angel and give him words which the angel then, uh, then passes on. We can reflect a little further on this by thinking about just the nature of and what, what, an, what it means to be an angel uh, in the Bible. An angel is a messenger. Sometimes the word is used for a human messenger. In Hebrew, the word is malach. That's the, the title of the last book of our Old Testament. Malachi is my messenger or my angel. And in the context of Malachi, uh, the, the messenger is a human messenger, a prophet. Uh, malach can also mean an, a spiritual messenger. The Lord sends out his malachim throughout the world uh, and they bring messages. The malach of Yahweh, that is the angel of Yahweh, is a particular angel who's the head of the angels and is identified with Yahweh and yet is also sent by Yahweh. So when we put all these pieces together in the Old Testament, what we have is a God who is a we, a God who can say, let us, and who makes humanity in the image of this God who can say, let us. It's a God who is somehow both Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh, and yet those are distinct. A God who is Yahweh, the sending God, and also the angel of Yahweh, who is the sent God. And once we start talking in those terms of a God who sends and a God who is sent, of a God who speaks and then a God who delivers the message that was spoken, uh, we're very much in the world of John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same Word that was with God and was God from the beginning has come into our world and taken on human flesh, and we have seen His glory, glory as of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There's a sending God who speaks a Word. There is the Word that is spoken, which is a distinct person, the messenger of God. Already in the Old Testament, we have this uh, fairly rich revelation of a relation, not just relationality and plurality within God, but a certain kind of relation. A God who sends and a God who is sent. A God who has a message and a God who delivers the message. And then a God who is an intercessor, a Yahweh, an angel of Yahweh, who is an intercessor before Yahweh and who prays on behalf of Israel before Yahweh. Uh, an, angel, an angel of Yahweh who is a mediator uh, and prays prayers of laments for the sake of the people. Okay. Again, we're already very much in the realm of the gospel story when we think on, in these terms. But I think that the Old Testament is not just showing us and preparing for us for the full revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament in those particular ways. We can look at particular passages um, and we can see that uh, the Old Testament is uh, fulfilled in the full revelation of, of Father, Son, and Spirit. But I think we can look in more broad, in broader terms and see the same kind of uh, pattern. That the Old Testament is setting up for the full revelation. It's the background for the full revelation of God as Father, Son, and Spirit in the New Testament. And let me highlight two things that uh, where that's two ways in which that's the case. Uh, the first is that the God of Israel is a God who shows Himself by His interventions in human history. Uh, God shows Himself and identifies Himself by uh, events that, uh, his, his actions in human history. This uh, way of thinking about God is, is quite different from the standard way of thinking about God that you have in much ancient paganism and much ancient Greco-Roman paganism we can think of in the uh, early centuries uh, uh, of the Christian church. Uh, ancient, ancient pagan gods were gods who were uh, distant from the world distant from time. Sometimes they're involved in time. You have the Olympian gods that get involved in the battles of the Trojan War, for example. But those Olympian gods who get involved in the battles of the Trojan War are kind of, they're, they're guiding things and they're making sure that this arrow is deflected and this person is, uh, is protected and this person is not protected. They're, they're intervening here and there. But they're really not, uh, in, they're not deeply involved in the action. They're not, nothing is at risk, certainly. They're immortals. Uh, they don't have any uh, they might get wounded in the course of the battle as some goddesses and gods do in the course of the Trojan War, but they're really immune from the changes in uh, of time and space. And then if you think of the philosophical gods of uh, later Greco Greek and Roman thought, uh, these gods are defined by being uh, timelessly changeless, uh, being uh, unmoved movers, being detached from the world and immune from 
time and not having contact with time, not having to contact with our world. That's what defines them as divine. But then Israel comes along and says, our God is not just a God who intervenes, but then a God who intervenes and then identifies himself by reference to those interventions. And he begins, begins to talk about himself as I am, not just the existing one, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a God who identifies himself with particular people to whom he's revealed himself. Uh, the first commandment in the, in the law, the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What God is it that we worship? It's a God, we don't define him by these kind of abstract attributes in the, in the first commandment. We define him by this event. He's intervened in human history. He, he's intervened in the history of Israel to fulfill his promise to Israel, to bring them out of Egypt, to bring them to Sinai, ultimately to bring them into the land. And then he says, that's the God I am. You want to know who I am? It's the God who's done that. And the thing that he's done is something that you can identify, something you can date, something, if you, something you could have seen, witnessed, if you had been in Egypt at the time. That's the God I am. I'm the God who did that. <laughs> and again, the setting up for the fuller revelation of the nature of God and the character of God in the New Testament, because the, the same thing is true in the New Testament. God identifies himself as the God who did that. What is the that that he does in the New Testament? The God who sent his son uh, to become flesh. The God who uh, raised his son from the dead. That's the God who's proclaimed in the, in the uh, gospel story. That's the God who's proclaimed by the apostles. It's a God who intervenes in history, who commits himself to history, and so intervenes in history that he can identify himself as the God who did those things in human history. So the Old Testament, by revealing this kind of God, again, it's not just the numbers game. It's not just about three and one. It's about a God who intervenes himself in history, identifies himself with these particular events, and then uh, fulfills that in the sending of his son and the redemption of the world through Jesus. And there's another way in which the Old Testament sets up for uh, the fuller revelation of the Trinity. And that is in the way that the Old Testament reveals us, to us a God who, is, uh, who promises and a God who is passionately committed to fulfilling those promises. God has committed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He committed himself to Abraham. I'm going to make you a, a great nation. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to bless all of the nations through you. Uh, the Israel that comes from Abram is not really faithful, uh, often not very faithful to those promises, but God keeps overriding their unfaithfulness. And God won't let his promises fail, even if Israel fails, he's gonna keep those promises. There are places in the law, and there are places, places in the Psalms and in the prophets where God himself enters into the, in, is, is described as being as suffering over the rebellions of Israel. Uh, Psalm 78, Israel rebelled against him again and again in the wilderness and it grieved his Holy Spirit. This is God who's made promises to Israel, who expects Israel to obey him and fulfill covenant so that those promises can be realized. And when they rebel, he suffers grief over their rebellion. In Numbers, where uh, Psalm 78 is talking about events in the book of Numbers, and in Numbers, we find God himself, not, not the angel of Yahweh is in Zechariah 1, but God himself, Yahweh, uh, lamenting. It's like a lament psalm. How long will I have to put up with Israel? <laughs> How long, O Lord? <laughs> the Lord speaking that. The Lord is not immune or untouched by the rebellion of his people. So these are, the, these are two pieces that we have in the Old Testament. God is utterly committed to Abraham and to his Abrahamic promise. He's going to make sure that those promises are kept. And he's a God who suffers over the failure of Israel to keep his commandments and to keep his covenant. So what is that God ultimately going to do to make sure that his promises are fulfilled? I wouldn't say that incarnation is kind of a logical conclusion to a syllogism. But it's also not... Uh, it's not out of character for this God to enter into our world, to suffer not just over our sins, but to take our sins on himself, to be so utterly committed to uh, keeping his promises to Israel that he becomes Israel in order to make sure those promises are kept. So committed to keeping those promises that he's willing to suffer Israel's opposition and hatred 
to make sure those promises are kept. That's all already there in the Old Testament. This is the God that Israel worshipped. And then we see the final step of that, the wondrous final step of that, when the Father sends the Son into the world to do just that. To take Israel's sins, to fulfill the Abrahamic promises, even at the cost of the death of his own son. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about Trinitarian theology. Not just three in one plurality and unity. We're talking about that God. The God who's revealed himself in the history of Israel. The God who continues and fulfill, fulfills that revelation in the New Testament in Jesus Christ. Of course, the New Testament is the fuller revelation. I've been saying that a number of times. And let me, uh, for the last few minutes this morning, uh, say a few things about that. Uh, and how the New Testament reveals its... Now, the New Testament uh, reveals this. It's sometimes said that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity really isn't evident in the New Testament, uh, that it's hard to find, and that it's, uh, if we were supposed to worship a God who's Father, Son, and Spirit, it should have been clear to us that this was true. Uh, once you start hunting around in the New Testament, I think you find that it's all over the place. There are explicit formulas of Father, Son, and Spirit. We're baptized into the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, Paul blesses in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit. Think about that for a moment. Think about both of those for a moment. Baptism is the naming of a person as God's property. This is the name of God attached to this person. In the Old Testament, that happened too. The name was attached to Israel, and Israel was supposed to bear that name with honor. They were not supposed to bear that name lightly. And now in the New Covenant, we're also supposed to attach the name, impose the name on people, people who, well, it, Father, Son, and Spirit must be the name of Yahweh, the new name of Yahweh, the full, fully revealed name of Yahweh. Now, we have the same kind of logic here. God's placed his name on Israel. Israel's supposed to live in terms of that name. Now God places his name on Israel, and bap, uh, on a new Israel in baptism. Um, so the name Father, Son, and Spirit is just an unpacking of the name Yahweh. Or think about what it means to bless. Bless in the name of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the blessing of Aaron in, in number six. Uh, it's a blessing in the name of Yahweh. That's one of the ways that Yahweh's name is imposed and placed on his people in blessing. And then Paul comes along, a Jew who knows the Aaronic blessing. I think I said Abrahamic. I meant Aaronic blessing in number six. He knows the Aaronic blessing in number six. He knows that blessing is only in the name of God, the God of Israel. But he says, may you be blessed in the name of God the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's naming the God of Israel, but he's naming the God of Israel as Father, Son, and Spirit. So you have those kind of explicit formulas in the New Testament. Um, I think you could probably find on every other page of the New Testament some indication that Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. Uh, there are, we go to John 1, the word was with God and the word was God as a proof text. Sometimes we go to Philippians 2 and some other places that explicitly say Jesus is equal to the Father. But every time that the New Testament says Jesus is kurios, Lord, it's asserting that Jesus is Yahweh. Every time the New Testament says that Jesus is the Savior, it's saying that Jesus is Yahweh. Because Israel, any Israelite knows that there is only one Savior, there's only one Lord, there's only one lawgiver, and that's the God of Israel. But now here these Christians come along and they're using these titles that should be reserved for Yahweh and they're applying to, to this Jesus. Every time the Christians say that, they're saying, they're asserting something about Jesus' divine identity. That's not just saying that he's the, Yahweh's agent to come, or the Lord's agent to come and save us. That's an assertion of his nature. The Spirit is said to sanctify. The Spirit consecrates. And that's an assertion of the divinity of the Spirit. That's something that the Lord does in the Old Testament. Uh, when the tabernacle is built, the Lord comes in his glory and the Lord inhabits the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is consecrated by the glory of God. That's what makes things holy. We, we read it in, in uh, Exodus 3. Don't uh, uh, take your shoes from off your feet. Take your sandals from off your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. What makes it holy? Well, Yahweh is there. Yahweh consecrates things by his presence. And now in the New Testament, we learn that the Spirit consecrates things by his presence. Therefore, for anyone thinking in Old Testament terms, 
the spirit must be Yahweh. It must be the God of Israel in a new, uh, in a, uh, a f- more fully uh, revealed form. I think one of those dramatic examples of uh, this uh, of the New Testament uh, revelation of the Trinity is in uh, 1 Corinthians 8. This is a passage that uh, N.T. Wright points to, uh, and I think very effectively. Paul's talking about meat sacrifice to idols. And he says, uh, Concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are many gods, whether in heaven or earth, or indeed there are many gods and many lords, or say, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. Perfectly Jewish confession here. In fact, it's so perfectly Jewish, it's almost like a, a paraphrase of the Jewish confession, which is back in Deuteronomy 6, uh, what's known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength. Paul says, there is no God but one. That's a paraphrase of the Shema, which is the great Jewish confession of one God, of monotheism. For us, he says, there is but one God. Again, a confession of the oneness of the God of Israel. And he says that this God is the creator, the God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. That's exactly what the Shema goes on to say. This is the one God, hero Israel, your God is one, and you exist for him, to love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And then Paul goes on and says something that no non-Christian Jew would say. He places somebody else into the Shema. Okay, so a Jew wouldn't say, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one, and Baal. Okay. You don't have any and when you say the Lord your God is one. That would, be, that would violate the whole point of the Shema. The Shema is a confession that only the God of Israel is God. And Paul is paraphrasing that confession, but he adds somebody into the midst of this confession of the Shema. There is only one God, the Father, and one Lord. One kurios is the Greek, and the Greek word again is a word that refers back to Yahweh, the God of Israel. There is only one Lord by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Now, obviously, there's parallelism here. There's God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the one from whom are all things. Jesus Christ is the one by whom are all things. We exist for the Father. We exist through the Son. The fact that Paul puts Jesus into this paraphrase of the Shema by itself indicates that he thinks of Jesus being part of the divine life, being part of God. And then the parallelism suggests not only that he's there, but he also, but he's both united to and distinct from the Father. Creation comes from the Father as the origin of all things. Creation comes by Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. God the Father spoke the world into existence. It originated from him. God the Son is the eternal word by whom, the agent by whom the world came to be. The Father and Jesus Christ together are the one God that Paul confesses. Together are the one creator. But in that one act of creation, they're being distinguished as origin and agent. Uh, The one God is the Father for whom we exist. We exist for his sake. We exist to serve him. Jesus Christ is with him as as the one God. And it's through him that we exist. It seems that the Father is the goal toward which we live for him. Jesus is the, again, the, the agent by whom we live. Uh, we could put it in terms from John's Gospel. Uh, the Father is the uh, destination of our way, and Jesus is the way that leads to that destination. 
But the way and the destination are both God. The goal to which we go, the God, the God the Father for whom we exist, and God the Son who takes us to the Father, are both God. Okay. I don't think you could, you're looking for a proof text for the, uh, for the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is Father and Son. We know from elsewhere in the New Testament that he's Spirit, but here it's Father and Son that Paul's focusing on. If you wanted a, a proof text that shows uh, that the God of Israel is being described in Trinitarian terms, uh, this is a great one because this is a confession of the God of Israel, the one God, that is a confession of the one God who is Father in the Lord Jesus. Um, we, have, we normally have passages like that. I'll, I'll close with just this last comment. But we have in the New Testament, <coughs> the structure of the gospel itself is described in Trinitarian terms. Uh, God is the God of the gospel. The Trinity is a way of summarizing the gospel story. Uh, the triune God is the God revealed in the gospel. And that's what all the church fathers are trying to do. They're trying to defend the gospel when they talk about the Trinity. They're not trying to philosophize about God. They're not introducing some alien philosophical concepts. They're trying to expound what it means for God to be God, the God of the gospel. And that's rooted in the New Testament. For example, this at the beginning of the letter to the Romans. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And then he goes into a brief summary of that gospel of God. This gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born of, a, of the seed of the David, seed of David according to the flesh, and was declared Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, for his name's sake, among whom also you are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved in God, in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 7 there is one example of a blessing that's pronounced not just in the name of God, but in the name of God and Jesus. That itself uh, is a indication of the divine character that Jesus has. But the, notice the way that he summarized. First of all, it's the gospel of God which is promised beforehand in the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. It's prepared by the Old Testament. It's proclaimed and promised in the Old Testament. It's concerning the Son of God, who is a seed of David, who is born a seed of David according to the flesh, and then who is raised from the dead by the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. So the gospel of God, the good news about God, is that God has sent his son to be born as, a, as the seed of David, to take flesh. The good news is that the God, that God, the God of Israel, who has worked and promised in the Old Testament, has now raised the son of God from the dead by the Spirit. The good news is the good news about the Father, who promised and then sent, the Son who comes as the seed of David according to the flesh, <laughs> the Spirit who is the Father, Father's agent for raising the Son from the dead. You summarize the Gospel story fully and you're giving <coughs> a summary of the, of the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm going to stop there <coughs> because I'm having a <coughs> coughing fit. <coughs> and also because we're out of time for the first session, but we'll pick up there uh, in the next session.